Hi, this is Jose Luis, and in the previous video on this playlist, Learning Parametric Modeling, uh, we explained how to do basic geometry, simple geometry, using parametric modeling here in Grasshopper. Uh, and we saw how to create a sphere, a cone, and a cylinder using simple components and starting off from numerical parameters. Now, what I want to explain in this video is that you can see how just for three simple objects, a sphere, a cone, and a cylinder, we already have quite some stuff going on here. And uh, my point here being that uh, very soon, as soon as the complexity in our grasshopper definitions, remember the definition is the file that contains all these components, as soon as the complexity starts growing, we're going to start um, going into what's called spaghetti mode, where we basically have so many components and so many wires connecting them that there is a lot of clutter and there's a lot of stuff. It's very difficult to manage. That's why I make so much emphasis on grouping things properly and giving things names to things so that we avoid the visual clutter. But the visual clutter will not only be on Grasshopper, it will also be here on the window. Because as you can see, we already have like six geometry entities. So I can see the surfaces, I can see their their center points. And arguably, when I am designing, I may not always want to have all the geometry visually here on the screen. So what I want to make sure that we understand is that first of all, whatever we have in Grasshopper, it's always going to be just a pre visualization. Okay, what that means is that this sphere, this point, whatever, they're not real geometry in Rhino. And I will explain that in a second. There's just a pre visualization of what it would be whenever I make I transfer that geometry from Grasshopper to Rhino, which again, we will see in this video. Um, it's just a pre visualization. And actually, for example, if you see me close Grasshopper, you see that everything just disappears, because um, it's just not it doesn't exist, right. And if I turn Grasshopper again, everything comes back in. So that's one thing we still we have a parametric definition, we have a ways to work with all this geometry, but the geometry is really not there yet. And also, if we have too much geometry, may, we may actually want to turn things on and off. So for example, um, arguably, the points that I use to generate these surfaces are not very important. Because um, uh, what I actually care is about the surfaces. So how could I turn them off? Well, first of all, they also another thing to understand is that grasshopper has a way of highlighting what every component by default will show up whatever geometry for every component we have will show up on the screen on this one here. Um, but if I and but sometimes I may not know if I have many sphere components, which one is which. So what I can do is I can actually click on the components. And you can see that the surface or the geometry that corresponds to that component will turn green as a way of understanding that this particular component represents this geometry. And this point here represents this green point that we have here. And this cone here represents the surface and this point here represents uh, this, this center here. Um, this one here represents and this one this point represents this one here. If you are colorblind, uh, or if you have problems seeing between um, red and green, there's actually ways here to change the default colors that uh, are assigned to normal geometry and to selected geometry. So you can customize them here in this um, in this panel. So that's one thing. If I have a lot of geometry, just by clicking on it, I can see which one corresponds to which component. And the other thing that I can do is I can basically just turn off the visualization of geometry that is not important for me. So for example, this point might be a little annoying, or if I have too many of them, I can just decide to not show them on the screen. The way to do that is by clicking on the component, and then clicking with the center mouse wheel button. All right. And then choosing to use the uh, whatever the eye blind, the mask kind of icon to disable the preview of the component. Okay, there's two ways of disable. You can disable the whole thing so that the component does not work. This component is not producing points anymore, and therefore the sphere is also not working. This is not what I want. I want the component to work internally. I just don't want to see it. So that's why I'm clicking on the mask so that the visualization is off. 
even though the component is still working. And you see that the component gets a darker gray color and, um, and it doesn't show up anymore. Same for this other point. I can click it and I can turn off the mask. Or, for example, I can click the component and I can choose, if you go to, um, I don't know, here, yes, no preview. I actually don't know, but I know that the shortcut is Control Q to disable automatically the visualization. So I'm pressing Control Q to turn it off and Control Q to turn it on again with the component selected. And the same for the sphere. I can disable the sphere by pressing Control Q, disable this one and disable this one. Again, they're still there. They're just not visually represented. So I can just keep, for example, the sphere or the cone or the cylinder, all right? Okay, so just to make sure that uh, we focus on the right stuff, I'm going to turn off the cone and the cylinder and I'm going to keep the sphere, all right? And as I said before, um, the thing with Grasshopper is that I work with a pre-visualization here. This is not real geometry in Rhino yet. But let's say that I have worked with this like really nice Grasshopper definition, has like tons of complex geometry relationships, etc. And I have like the final form that I want, the perfect sphere. I have mastered the perfect sphere and I now want to be able to, I don't know, send this sphere to my client or uh, make a nice rendering with this sphere or send it to a competition, whatever that is. I want to make sure that I have a way of taking this geometry that is like the finer perfect form that it's uh, or and mm, put it in Rhino so that I can start manipulating, exporting it and doing whatever I want to do with it. So the way to take geometry from a grasshopper definition and make it permanent in a Rhino file and then use it whatever else you want is by following a process that is called baking. Baking is the act of taking a geometry entity that is parametric, that is in Grasshopper and that has like all this variability and freezing it so that it becomes actual form in Rhino that can be used for rendering, for exporting, for 3D printing, whatever that is. The way to do that is you go to the component that has the geometry that you want to bake. So for example, this sphere here, and you right click on the output that you want to bake. So for example, the S, and you click on this icon that has the fried egg, the baking. When you do that, you select which layer you want to send the geometry object to. And if this component had multiple spheres inside of it, which we will see very soon, you may want to choose to group all of them together so that you don't have like a thousand different spheres and you have to click each one of them independently. We'll see that very soon. I, as I press OK, what will happen is that all of a sudden I have this new thing going on here. I'm going to right click on perspective and show, for example, rendered so that I can see a rendered visualization of my sphere. Or I can say, for example, I like ghosted a lot. And you can see that now this has a different quality. I have these surfaces, I have these ISO trims, all right? And I can actually now click on the sphere. You see, I can actually click on this thing and this is actual geometry now that is living in Rhino. And if I close, if I close my grasshopper, you can see that now I have a sphere that is ge real geometry that is living in Rhino. Okay, so that's great. So I have been able to take my sphere and to bake it into a geometrical entity in Rhino. However, we need to remember something very important. Baking is, as I was saying, is kind of freezing the geometry. What that means is that the moment you take a particular combination of parameters, you turn it into a form, and then you bake that form, what you're basically doing is freezing all that tree of parametric relationships into one final form that is definite. And what that also means is that as soon as that form goes from grasshopper into Rhino, the form that we have in Rhino has lost all the relationship that it had uh, with the parametric set of relationships that generated it. What I mean with that is that if I now, for example, change the inputs, the parameters, you can see that the previsualization of the sphere is adapting, but the baked sphere that I had before 
is not being affected because it was frozen in time, because it was baked. It, this sphere here is the footprint, if you will, of how the parameters were when I decided to bake this sphere. And as soon as I bake it, anything that I do afterwards to that sphere does not affect anymore this actual uh, frozen baked geometry that I have in Rhino. They lose that relationship. Okay, so baking in a way is like printing. You bake whatever you had, you print it, and then that cannot accept any more changes or any more parametric relationships. Okay, that's very important to understand. Um, but what's beautiful about this is that now I can use my grasshopper definition as a way to generate multiple versions of my sphere. So for example, I can now bake another one and I can just have it the second sphere. Now I can find like a third uh, way of like, oh, this is another sphere that I like, so I'm also going to bake this. And now I have a third sphere here, which is kind of great, etc., etc., etc. As you can imagine for spheres, this is a fairly trivial process, but we will see very soon in more advanced videos down this playlist how when you create like surfaces with apertures and things poking out, etc., exploring all the different variabilities and the results that you can find in the different combinations of parameters is actually super helpful and very interesting. And it's one of the biggest powers of parametric modeling. Um, so that's that. And then finally, I also want to talk about saving files. So for example, what happens with Grasshopper and Rhino? What's the relationship between these files? I just want to remind you that Grasshopper files, Grasshopper definitions are their own type of file. So if I go here to file and to save document as, it will ask me to where do I want to save this? For example, my desktop, and then it will give me, it will prompt me to save the file as GH, which is um, the Grasshopper default format. So that's one thing, but the RAS hopper file will always be independent from the Rhino file. So in the Rhino file, I can go here and save as, and I, this will be, for example, three spheres, all right? And this file will be independent from my grasshopper files. They're both unique and they don't have any relationship between each other. The grasshopper file only contains this parametric generator of spheres, and my Rhino file right now contains the three frozen, the three baked spheres that I created from this definition. But there's no relationship between each other and I could always open them up independently um, without the need for them to be together. There's only a few situations where I want to have them together and I will explain those in further videos down the road. Okay? Um, and last but not least, a tiny, um, a tiny Easter egg. Um, sometimes, for some reason, you may want to actually share a screenshot of your definition to share with people to explain your parametric model, how the relationships came about, how you generated some form. You might be tempted to use your systems, a screen shooting system, a screen shooting uh, capacities, but um, that's not going to be great because it's going to also take up the UI, it's going to take this like grid, background grid, whatever. So. Grasshopper actually comes with a very powerful screen shooting system. So I can export here a high resolution image of what I have here in my definition. So for example, I'm going to say that this is going to go to my desktop. I'm going to call this definition screenshot, for example. I'm going to say that the zoom level is going to be two. The background is going to be white and fully transparent. That's going to be nice because then I can overlay this on a PowerPoint or something. And then this menu popped up on my other screen. Sorry, you couldn't see it. But if I go to my desktop now, I have this file called definition screen. And you can see that I have now a very nice screenshot that is actually transparent. I can overlay on top of other things with my geometry. And this like bifocal component that I'm using to, um, to see um, this is my focal component that I'm using to have the components, have the icons, but also has have this label on top. All right. Wonderful. With that, I think we are ready to start looking into more complex stuff. We know the basics of the interface. We know the basics of how to do simple arithmetic, how to do simple geometry. So I think we're done with simple. I think it's a good time to now start looking at 
more complex geometry, more complex relationships, and how to handle uh, streams of data, not just single numbers, which is a very important topic in Grasshopper. So let's take a look at that in the next videos on this playlist. Uh, but just saying, if you're liking what you see so far, please consider subscribing to this channel, uh, liking this video, turning on notifications, joining our Discord channel, and all those things that kept, keep us uh, motivated and help us spread the word of what we do here. Thanks a lot, and see you in the next video.